Uh, my name is Brad Peterson, and I'm a faculty member here at uh, Southampton. And uh, I have a few announcements. One, I'd like to welcome you tonight uh, to the first of the spring lecture series. Every Friday, the first Friday of every month for the spring semester, we'll be having lectures here. Uh, and uh, um, we also have, uh, Kurt, you have an announcement to make? And there was a Honda in the parking lot with a dome light on. We don't know. Supposedly. All right. Took care of it. Okay. Very good. Very good. Um, anyway, I would like to introduce tonight's speaker, Aaron Freeman. Aaron is coming to us from Adelphi uh, University, where he's been for the last four years. Uh, and uh, I, I met Aaron before he took this job. Aaron has had a, a, a lively uh, and exciting uh, route to being a professor, and hopefully uh, after his talk we'll have time to talk with him about some of his adventures in far away and exotic places uh, that he's been. But uh, to start, I'd like to welcome Aaron to the uh, podium and uh, welcome you to here tonight. Does this work? Thanks, Brad. Um, so my talk tonight is focused on work that I've done over the last 10 years, I guess. Um, it's hard for me to believe I've been at Adelphi for four years now because um, it seems to go by really fast. Um, so I'm going to be talking today, show the outline, about induced morphological defenses, um, bioinvasions, and how rapid evolution can relate to induced defenses, and talk about some biogeographic comparisons of induced defenses. And finally, of course, end with a sunset photo, as all talks do these days. Um, so induced morphological defenses can include a variety of different morphological changes that organisms can go through. During, and they, they will go through these changes during their own lifetime. Um, the examples I have up here are, include uh, Daphnia, which is a freshwater clodosterin. And during development, if it senses cues from predatory fish, it will change its morphology. And one of the relevant things about Daphnia's biology is that they reproduce parthenogenically. So they are essentially clones of, um, of previous generations. So these individuals shown here have, um, they are genetically identical to each other. Let me try to change the lights here. There. So, um, so within a, um, within, its, within a single generation, within a single lifetime, the Daphne will change its morphology to have these head spines and tail spines, and they're a defended morphology against predators. And they're clones of the same individual. So these are, this is a phenotypic change despite genetic um, similarities. In the marine realm, there's a, a, a barnacle, coast of California, that undergoes a similar morphological change where it, in the presence of predatory whelks, it develops this um, bent morphology. And the bent morphology is less uh, susceptible to predation from a, a whelk. And the whelk usually lose, uses a spine to penetrate through and access the soft tissue inside the barnacle. So these are um, morphological defenses, um, a defended morph on the top and um, undefended morph uh, on the right and on the bottom here. Um, but one thing to bear in mind with these induced defenses is that there's always some sort of a trade-off. Um, the organism, when it's defended, is better defended, but there's, it's usually at some sort of a cost. Otherwise, these organisms would perpetually be, be expressing that um, defended morphology. So in the case of the clodocerin, they have re reduced swimming ability when they're expressing this um, defended morphology. And in the case of the barnacle, when they have this bent morphology on the top, they would have reduced space for reproductive organs, etc. So there's, there's lower reproductive output in this case. So there's always this, this um, dynamic play for these organisms to either express this defended morphology or to not express this defended morphology. Now, the organism I've looked at in the past is um, the blue mussel, Middleus edulis. And this is the common dinner mussel that you might order. Um, if you go out, um, you'd have it with butter and garlic um, or some other white wine sauce or something. But um, this is the, the blue mussel that we have 
uh, from the Chesapeake Bay all the way up to Newfoundland and over into Europe. S similar species. There are two different subspecies, but um, morphologically identical. Um, when the blue mussel senses cues from predatory crabs or sea stars or whelks, um, they will change their morphology. They'll thicken their shell sometimes. They will um, create a larger adductor muscle. And the adductor muscle is the, um, the muscle inside the muscle, the blue muscle, that closes the valves and limits access to predators from the outside. They'll also increase their bissel volume. And bissel threads are what anchor these muscles to the substrate. So they're, they're harder for a predator to pull off of the substrate. So these muscles are prey to a number of different predators. And the predators can include the sea star, the stereus, and the top. Um, and the sea star tends to pull the muscles open in order to access the soft tissue. The sea stars then will actually um, insert their own stomach. So they'll turn their own stomach inside out and begin digesting the muscle inside its own shell. So it's kind of gruesome death for the, sea, the muscles. But it's an effective uh, attack strategy for the sea star. So they pull open the shell. Um, the other predator is one we have here. We, we have both species of predators. Um, the green crab, the European green crab, um, tends to crush the shell or pry them open, clan, can opener. Do people want me to turn the lights on back there? Is that okay? Okay. All right. So um, these are different. These represent different attack strategies, and the um, implication is that the muscle has to be defended against these different attack strategies, and um, the induced defense, if it's well-tuned, well-honed to the predator's attack strategy, will be different for these different predators. And I've, during my PhD, I ran s uh, several experiments that looked a lot like this with hoses and flowing seawater running all through them. Um, but the motivation for this was to try to see what happens when muscles, little small 10 millimeter muscles that I collected in the field, when they were raised with cues from these green crabs or from the sea star, how would they express this, these induced defenses? So I would raise these muscles um, after doing some initial measurements, raise them in one of these ap one of these experimental arrays, and expose them to cues from um, either a sea star, or actually in this case it was two sea stars, or two crabs, or a crab and a sea star. So looking at the effect of multiple predators in terms of whether the muscle will express appropriate induced defenses to these different predators. I want to show you some results from that. This is partly just to illustrate the aspect of induced defenses. Um, I'll show you different parameters that I me measured in these muscles. They include shell thickness, the adductor muscle, again, for closing the shell, and the overall tissue weight, the growth of these muscles during the experiment. So on the left, this first one is shell thickness. Um, it's measured in terms of, it's an index of shell thickness, and the, the values seem to have fallen off here. But um, it's suffice to say that only in the presence of the green crabs that the muscles actually thicken their shell. So they express a predator-specific response that is appropriate to that predator. They didn't thicken their shell in response to the sea stars in this experiment. And they didn't thicken their shell when they experienced cues from both predators simultaneously. So when I ex looked at the adductor muscle, this is the, the muscle that closes the bivalve shell. Um, I found that they, the, sea, the muscles did not um, increase their adductor muscle strength when they're exposed to the crabs, but they did in response to the sea star. So these are, again, this is a predator-specific response. But when both predators are around, um, the muscles express neither predator-specific response. So essentially, the, the muscles seem to be freaking out and not able to express the appropriate defense. Um, and there's, there are a number of reasons for this. One might be that they are, um, they reduce feeding, and that's a, another possibility, because they seem to have reduced tissue growth rates in response to both predators. So um, there are potentially multiple predator effects uh, in this situation where there are multiple predators. More than one predator will actually um, uh, undermine the effectiveness of these induced defenses. So these are induced defenses in response to the sea star here is a native predator. Um, the green crab is an introduced predator. Um, it's, it's a European green crab. And so it's a bit surprising when I was running the experiments or sort of thinking about it broadly that the sea star, that the mussels would recognize the green crab at all. So this is 
there's a phenomenon I'm sure you're aware of that where bioinvasions are occurring. Humans are breaking down barriers that over evolutionary history have separated different geographic regions, and new species are being introduced into these areas. Um, and we're experiencing this, experiencing this on Long Island with the green crabs. Um, there's an Asian shore crab that's introduced here. And um, if we talk about terrestrial systems, there's a lot of invasive species here. But after an invasion occurs, after a bioinvasion occurs, um, there's a possibility for rapid evolution to occur, where the invader changes its um, sort of overall lifestyle. It evolves in response to its new habitat, but also the um, native species can respond to an invasive predator. And there's, this can happen rather fa quickly. Um, Dave Resnick, who's worked in, with Trinidad guppies, has found that within um, 10 to 15 generations, um, these guppies will develop, uh, change their morphology in response to introduced predators in those river streams. So it can happen very quickly. And this is referred, this is a phenomenon of rapid evolution. Similarly, um, cane toads have been introduced to Australia. And these have sort of marched across the continent in the last 40 or 50 years. And with the spread of these cane toads, the native snakes have undergone rapid evolution in response to um, an alarming kind of uh, interaction here. The cane toads actually turn out to be poisonous. They, are, they kill any predator that um, eats them. And luckily, most children just use them as um, toys or pets. But dogs and cats or snakes consume the toads and tend to not survive that event. So snakes that consume these cane toads end up dying and are actually removed from the population. And the snakes that remain have tended to have a narrower um, gape in their mouth size. So um, these cane toads, by spreading across Australia, have limited or narrowed the size of the native snakes um, just through natural selection. So these are invasive predators, and they've had an effect on the native communities. Um, how does this relate to um, how are induced defenses expressed in response to these invasive predators? You have a new predator in a region, in an area. Um, can the native prey recognize that as a predator? And I want to set up a few scenarios here that would sort of um, set up hypotheses that would um, look at how or when a native prey would recognize the predator. So on the y-axis here, I have a response. These would be a behavioral response or a morphological response, a change in shell thickness or um, hiding behavior that the prey may show in response to this in, uh, a marching invasion. Um, and if we look at in an, um, different populations, one might, be one might be uninvaded. It's naive to that new predator. And one might be invaded, where that predator is established and has had an effect for um, generations. If, well, we might be not be surprised. But, well, in one such scenario, there might be no response where none of the prey actually recognize the invasive predator. And no amount of time following the invasion do the, do allows them to actually express an induced defense or change in behavior. They just don't recognize that invasive predator. So there's really the predator is having a large um, numerical effect on the prey, um, but has very little um, behavioral or morphological change in for the, on the prey. So there's another scenario would be in which the prey recognize the predator as a predator, um, but they always recognize that predator. Essentially, you might imagine that an uninvaded population is not naive to that invasive predator. Um, they recognize that the threat posed by that predator. Um, but if you had an invaded population, this might not be a surprise. But in an uninvaded population, you, if you took individuals from that population and they recognized the predation threat from that predator, then that would indicate there's a pre-existing response to that invasive predator. And this might be to a, due to a number of different things. The invader might resemble a native prey or native predator enough so that the native prey recognize that predator. There are a few other scenarios that are potentially possible. So that's another pre-existing response that might occur um, in these populations. A third possibility, and there are potentially more possibilities, but one, a third would be um, where there's post-invasion development of a response. In this case, you might have an invaded population, um, or an uninvaded population, excuse me, that 
doesn't recognize a predator. This would not be surprising to you because they have no evolutionary history with that predator. Um, you could also have, um, if, if you see a response in the invaded population, then you might presume that there's a change that's occurred uh, in these native prey in response to the invasion. So there would be um, potential for evolution to have occurred in this case, or potential for learning on the part of the prey to, to recognize that predator. So these are different scenarios that might occur. And one of the dominant, or one of the sort of more pervasive predators we have on, on Long Island is the Asian shore crab, Hemigraphsis sanguineus. Um, until 30 years ago, Asian shore crabs were completely absent from Long Island. Um, but since, the, since 1988, they were first found in 1988, they spread um, from some place in New Jersey all the way up to mid-coast Maine. And they reach very high densities. Um, and this is me turning over a rock. And you can see the ground is basically moving, partly because I'm moving the camera, but partly because the crabs are scurrying around. So they are quite high densities um, under I in the intertidal and potentially and often subtidal as well. So these, and these Asian shore crabs do feed on various mussels in the intertidal. So one of the experiments I ran was when I looked at um, the distribution uh, of mussels. The mussels range from um, down in the Chesapeake all the way up to Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and across the Atlantic. So different species. There's a species break in the northern Maine area. Um, but if you look at the invasion history of the green crab, the green crab in introdu was introduced around 1850 or early 1800s, and it's spread up to um, Nova Scotia and as far north as Newfoundland. Consequently, um, all of the prey, all the organisms on the east coast of the U.S. have had some level of experience with the green crab. Now, the Asian shore crab, on the other hand, was introduced around 1988, um, and it's spread as far as mid-coast Maine in 2003. This result of this is that in northern Maine, there are populations of um, all mussels, snails, etc., that have never experienced predation from the green crab. But, um, well, and when I pulled mussels from those populations, this would be um, mussels that I raised with the different, um, different predator cues from the Carcinus, which has been around for a while, it's well established, and the Asian shore crab, which has never made it as far north as northern Maine. Um, I found that there was a change in shell index. The, 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 the mussels actually thicken their shell in response to the uh, green crab, but they don't seem to recognize the Asian shore crab as a predator. So they don't thicken the shell in response to the, the um, Asian shore crab. When I selected mussels from farther south, um, around the Long Island area, Rhode Island, um, I found that those mussels actually did increase their shell thickness in response to the Asian shore crab. So there appears to be some, some kind of evolution or acquired predator recognition that's occurring in these populations in which the mussels have um, developed the capacity to respond to this invasive crab and the invaded populations are showing a response, but the, uh, whereas the uninvaded populations do not show a similar response. So put a postmark in that, because we'll come back to it shortly um, in terms of talking about um, snails and how they respond. So what I've talked to you so far about is um, morphological responses. Um, I want to now shift gears slightly and talk about a trophic cascade, where there would be many organisms involved. Um, instead of just two trophic levels, a crab predator and a, a, a mussel prey, uh, I want to start talking about three trophic levels or more. Well, I'm only going to talk about three. But um, this falls into a category of a trophic cascade, where you may have um, top predators feeding on intermediate predators and lower trophic levels. And one of the classic examples is this work done by um, Estes and people in his lab looking at sea otters that feed on um, sea urchins and the sea urchins subsequently feed on kelp. Um, in areas where there are um, no orcas, no killer whales, uh, sea otters do just fine. They eat all the sea urchins. And then there is more kelp. And so this, when it's where orcas are present, um, they feed on the otters, which don't feed on the sea urchins. And then there's um, the sea urchin populations increase. So these, this is a trophic cascade where there's a trickle down from the higher trophic levels to the lower trophic levels. Um, this, in a more sort of simplified but on a grand scale, uh, has been uh, has some conservation 
uh, consequences. In the late 1800s, if you look at er, um, Yellowstone area, um, their wolves have been extirpated from Yellowstone around 18, in the late 1800s. Consequently, um, the elk populations got out of control and ate most of the aspens. So for the very few aspens recruited into this Yellowstone park area for over 100 years, what people have done recently, more recently, is introduce um, wolves, or reintroduce wolves to the population, which then scare the whelks, I'm sorry, scare the elks. Um, see where I'm going with this. And the elk are then less likely to feed on the aspens. So there's a trickle down from the predator to the, pr to the prey, and the prey's prey, down three trophic levels. Um, however, this is not, the change is due to the change in behavior, not necessarily due to direct predation. So these behavioral trophic cascades, or simply fear, can drive a lot of changes across different communities. Uh, so it's a behaviorally mediated trophic cascade that can occur in these situations. Now, not to be too grand about it, but I'm looking at a similar system. I've looked at a similar system on a finer scale. It's a little hard to get IACUC approval to work, work with wolves in the lab. So um, this is a little more convenient in a lot of ways. Looking at crabs having a behavioral effect on uh, predatory whelks. And the whelks, um, in optimal situations, would be feeding on a lower, the lowest trophic level in this situation. And this would be the blue muscle middleus. Um, now, whelks have a particular way of feeding on the, whelk, on the muscles. They'll tend to use specialized teeth called radula that will drill through the shell of a muscle and then access the soft tissue inside the muscle and secrete digestive fluids um, into and basically digest the muscle inside its shell. So, but they leave a nice telltale mark that they have been there with the radula holes going through the, whel the muscle shell. I found that whelks taken from different populations re will respond differently to these predators. Um, wave protected sites, they'll actually, the whelks will reduce the number of mussels that they've eaten um, in response to the sea stars um, or carcinus or both predators simultaneously. So carcinus cues do reduce foraging in nucella, this intermediate predator. Um, but it depends on which population they come from. Um, this would be a wave protected site and a wave exposed site. And that's, there's uh, some hydrodynamics here um, that are important for Q transmission, which I'll come to shortly later. Um, there's also this, the whelks from the wave exposed site tend to feed less. But there's a population differences in terms of the whelks, where they are, and how much they actually respond to the different predators. So looking, this is on a local scale, from wave exposed sites to wave protected sites. Um, they, the whelks will also change their morphology. They'll thicken their shell in response to waterborne cues from the predator. So you'd have a, a whoops, um, you'd have thinner shelled individuals that would then develop thicker shells in response to waterborne cues from the crab. So the, there's a lot of, that can happen on a local scale where wave exposure like this will interrupt feeding by the whelks and interrupt cues being transferred from the crab to the prey. Um, now, looking at a broader scale phenomenon where the green crabs have been, invas have been introduced to a lot of different areas. Green crabs are lit native to Europe, North Africa. Um, they've been introduced to Eastern North America um, for over 100 years, um, in our region more than 100 years. Um, they've also been introduced to Australia for over 100 years. And um, so I'm going to compare these two areas and looking at how whelks in these different regions respond to the green crabs. And I'm going to focus first on the Australia system. Now, traveling to Australia is a lot of fun. Um, and this is, this is, for you marine people, this is not a sea urchin. This is an echidna. Um, but it's, kind of, it's going to a new region is like being a, in a new, being a, in a, a, a toy shop where you have all sorts of new toys. Um, and there's a lot of uh, unrecognized um, organisms to me. But one of the things that is sim simple, similar, and luckily for me, um, there's essentially this concept called assembly rules, where in particular habitats, you'd have similar organisms that would occupy similar niches. And in this region in Australia, we have, um, there in the intertidal, there's a, a mussel. The blue, uh, it's, it's sort of the analogous mussel to the blue mussels, our filter feeders. They're lowest on the trophic level. Um, and they're abundant in the intertidal. 
But feeding on those mussels are these whelks. Um, the whelk is a same family, different genus from the whelks we have here. So there's the potential for, in this system, for the green crabs to have a cascading effect on the behavior of these intratidal whelks in terms of how they feed on the native mussels in that area. The whelks genus is Haustrum, and the mussels genus is Limnoperna. Um, and there's another, some other parallels as well. In Australia, there, there's some regions in Australia that have been invaded for over 100 years, and other areas in Tasmania, for instance, where on the east coast of Tasmania, um, the green crabs have been invasive for about 20 years now. But on the west coast of Tasmania, um, green crabs have never been established. So you have these completely naive populations in those areas. Um, and I wanted to compare the different populations in terms of how they respond to the green crabs. So I collected whelks from four invaded sites and four uninvaded sites. Um, the invaded sites having been invaded for 100 years, and the uninvaded sites have never been invaded. And in theory, these are fairly, these are populations that are separated by um, habitats that are inhospitable to whelks or snails. Um, beautiful habitats, but not good for whelks for, for living in those intermediate areas. I brought these whelks back to a marine lab in, um, well, it's a marine, landlocked marine lab, um, but they had a supply of seawater. I'm not sure how. Well, they, they trucked it in. Um, but they, I looked at the behavioral responses of whelks, looking at how they fed on mussels. Um, and then I count, just simply counted the number of mussels that were consumed in these experiments. And I had the whelks exposed. They were, whelks would be housed in a container like this, a mesh sided container, um, in the same bucket as um, predatory crabs. So they would be exposed to cues from the crabs, but no actual physical contact. And this would be replicated throughout the uh, a lab. So I, w I looked at the behavioral responses of whelks collected from areas that had been highly exposed for 100 years to the green crab and whelks that had never exposed to the green crab in a, an intermediate population in eastern Tasmania. And I looked at the number of mussels that were drilled and found that um, in res the control is up here in each situation is the highest number of mussel consumed. And in response to the green crab, they reduced foraging. Um, when the whelks experience cues from the green crab, they always reduce foraging. Um, there's a native crab that they had some sort of intermediate response to, but there's still a significant um, cue effect from these predators. So even these naive populations that have never experienced predation by the green crab seem to recognize the green crab and reduce foraging in response to it. I also looked at some morphological responses and found that there was no um, increase in shell thickness. Um, so there appears to be no um, morphological defense to uh, the green crab. But that seems to be particular for this, for this whelk, as um, the, these whelks in Australia, the house from species, tend to be um, fairly fragile. You have to be very careful in term when measuring them so they didn't crack the shells. So they don't, wouldn't have an, an effective induced defense anyway. So that was Australia. There's also in eastern North America, we have this native species of Nucella, the native whelk. I also wanted to look at how it would respond to the green crab cues. So I collected whelks from um, populations that have been invaded for 100 years and populations that have almost never been invaded. And I say almost never invaded because um, I started the study in 2009. And as I was finishing the study, I found out that the previous year someone had found green crabs in the southern shore of Newfoundland. Um, and so just to, sum, just to point out where I was, the invaded population, green crabs have slowly been spreading around the southern shore of Newfoundland. The sites I collected w were from the east coast of Newfoundland or farther north in the current distribution of green crabs. Although I, I expect green crabs have spread around Newf Newfoundland or, very, or will very soon. So over a period of three years, I collected whelks from 14 um, invaded sites and 11 uninvaded sites. S ran a similar experiment where I brought those whelks back into the lab and exposed them to waterborne cues from these different predators and um, counted the number of mussels that they, they consumed. Uh, and uh, for these cues, I used Carcinus as the invasive um, or cancer crabs as the native crab. I also looked at morphological responses, looked at um, change in terms of shell thickness, um, and ran these experiments four to six weeks. Um, so I'll just show you some of the results of the behavioral response. So these would be whelks that were collected from the invaded population in the Gulf of Maine. 
Um, and these would be the number of muscles consumed or dead and drilled during the experiment. And this would be the welts collected from um, an, an uninvaded population. And one of the outcomes, well, one of the effects is that um, invaded the Gulf of Maine welts consume more muscles in general uh, than the Newfoundland welts do. But I also found that wave exposure was important. Um, and there was an interaction between the cue and the wave exposure. So um, the muscles would respond to waterborne cues from the carcinus, but only if they were taken from a wave protected site. So only in these wave protected sites was there a reduction in foraging when these whelks detected uh, waterborne cues from the green crab. Furthermore, um, this is an uninvaded site up in northern Newfoundland. These whelks did not seem to recognize, or they, they did seem to recognize the carcinus. And so there is a behavioral response, even though there's no history of um, predation by green crabs on these whelks in Newfoundland. I also looked at the morphological responses, and this morphological responses take six weeks to observe, and there's a lot that can happen in six weeks. So there's potential for um, no response, which means that they just didn't grow very much in the lab. But the only situation in which I found a response was the, the experiment around 2011 in which there was a sh shell, an increase in shell weight in response to the green crab. So, but that only occurred in the invaded population. Um, wave exposure did not have an effect on the induced morphological defense. So there, there was a slight increase, there was a significant increase in shell thickness, or shell weight um, in these invaded populations. So it's indicative of a morphological defense. So this is a, so to summarize, basically an Australian and North American whelks appear to be pre-adapted to express some sort of a behavioral response to these, um, to this invasive crab, to the carcinus, where invaded and uninvaded population will express a behavioral response to this invasive crab. Um, but the morphological response, it didn't really happen in Australia, but in, in the North American example, it's more consistent with the post-invasion development of a response in which the invaded population seem to respond to the green crab. Um, the uninvaded population don't respond. And there are a lot of reasons for seeing no response. Um, so it, it's sort of thin evidence at this point that there's a real strong distinction between a behavioral and morphological defense. But there might be some inherent differences between induced morphological responses um, and induced um, behav behavioral responses. Um, it appears that the behavioral responses are pre-existing and the induced morphological responses may have evolved looking at the muscles from the previous experiment in response to hemigrapsis and the nucella in this experiment in response to the green crabs. Why would there be a difference between a morphological response and a behavioral response? Well, one is that behaviors, behaviors are fast, um, they're reversible, and they can be environmentally contingent. So they can be adjusted for the nutritional state of the, the snail or the mussel more readily than the morphological responses. Morphological responses, once they are induced, once they're started, they can't be taken back. So once a, a snail or a mussel thickens its shell, it's lost that uh, morphological space where it could otherwise have gonads or have soft tissue growth. Whereas behavioral responses may be um, on a day-to-day -day basis, they may be able to change back and forth. So that's one possibility. It, another sort of take-home point would be that um, wave exposure influences um, the North American whelks and how they respond to carcinus. Um, so there's a sort of paradigm one of the useful models in ecology is that there's a consumer stress model, which was put forward by Mengi and Sutherland. And they suggest that um, if you look at it along an environmental continuum, um, a low environmental stress, you'd have a high predation effect. So you'd have, predators would have a strong effect. Um, if you look at intermediate levels, a competition would start to take over, and in intermediate stress. And at very high stress environments, um, there would be physical factors would begin to take over. So uh, basically in a very stressful environment, nothing does well, and the, the, the desiccation or wave exposure would be so intense that organisms just don't do well in those environments. But if we look at predation on, a, on the sort of lower end of the environmental stress scale, there may be some sort of breakdown for different um, effects of predators within that environmental stress um, 
range. And this is a model put forward by Lee Smee. Um, and he's suggested that um, at low environmental stress, you'll have, um, hot, you'll have um, this whole model encompasses this predation area over here. So this is the net effect of the predators in this, in this whole environmental range. Um, at the low end of the environmental stress, you'd have non-consumptive effects, would have a large effect. So you may have strong um, behavioral responses to various predators. And that might be due to the fact that cues are transmitted effectively in these low stress environments, or prey have the option to alter their behavior in these low stress environments. But as the stress increases, um, then the, uh, the consumptive effects of the predator would take over. So you'd have stronger effects of direct predation on the prey items. So this might be analogous to the areas where I've, that I've looked at with the wave protected areas where there's, a, there's a non-consumptive effects are important for those whelks in that area. Whereas wave exposed sites are going to have um, more of a, consumptive effects would be more important and the non-consumptive effects or behavioral changes are going to be less important at these high stress environments. So this, the observations made in this study have been fairly consistent with, the, with, the, with that model. So another sort of take home conclusion is that behavioral responses shouldn't be, should be included among an invasive species impacts. We often think of invasive predators as having an effect on prey and consuming prey. But they are potentially going to have as much or a larger effect in the behavior of the prey that would be observed as indirect effects that would be um, changes in behavior of native organisms. Um, and also, when looking at the different responses or looking for predator recognition in these prey, it should uh, assays for these different um, recognition potentials should include multiple source populations because there can be a lot of local variation in terms of how adapted prey are to recognizing any predator in those situations. And I point out that nucella taken from wave exposed sites are less likely to respond to carcinus or any predator um, than whelks taken from a wave protected site, the wave, wave protected site. It's also important to look at multiple traits. Um, the induced the behaviors and induced morphologies don't show similar sensitivities to the crab cues. And this might be an inherent difference between morphological and behavioral responses to these different predators. Okay. Oh, there's the sunset photo. Um, thank you, and I'd like to acknowledge all the people who have made this work possible, and I'll take any questions if you have any. So um, these were, the presumption is that there's a waterborne cue being carried from the crab. I'm sorry? You know, uh, that's one thing. Um, I had, in these experiments, I had these, these buckets arranged where the crab and the, the snail were in the same container, but um, I couldn't isolate the effect or the possibility that the crab was creating a noise that the whelk could perceive. Um, it, but there's some good solid evidence that there's, there is a chemical cue that's given off by the crab that is then perceived by the whelk. And that would be something that sort of emanates out from the crab and is then um, s stimulates a response in the, the muscles or in the whelks. So it's a sort of like perfume sort of spreading across a room. Um, the odor from the crab is affecting the behavior and the morphology of the prey. The, the whole concept of these induced behavioral or morphological defenses is that the whelk or the muscle changes its behavior or changes its morphology in anticipation of that oncoming predation. So they use that chemical cue to change their own behavior or morphology um, to either become tougher to withstand the predation or to hide and avoid the predation. Um, well, they are, so there's an there's a interaction probably between um, the behavioral response where they reduce eating and this presumed induced morphological defense. 
So in these experiments, I tried to make sure that they had the, the whelks had enough food so they would have be able to consume and meet their own nutritional requirements. But part of their response is that the whelks are reducing their foraging, which will change the, the amount that they can actually grow. So as a whelk or mussel reduces its tissue growth, um, it still maintains its shell growth because they're, they're basically governed by different um, physiological requirements. So they can continue thickening their shell or growing their shell, and, but reduce their tissue growth. So there's this potential um, confounding effect of a behavior on the morphology. So there's this, um, there are some work out there suggesting that um, the behavioral responses may cause the appearance of a morphological response. So that is a series of experiments that sort of needs to be done to tease those two apart. Yes? I've got one here. So I was out in Hunt in Hampton <coughs> looking looking for these whelks. Um, the most southern population of this whelk is in Long Island, um, but they aren't very abundant. So I'm not surprised that you haven't heard of them or seen them. Um, they are much more common up in Maine, where I've done most of my work in Maine and New Hampshire. Um, they feed on um, mussels. They feed on barnacles as well. Uh, and so there are some interactions. I've had a student this last summer who was looking at um, how these whelks, when they're taken from different environments, <coughs> prefer different prey. Um, and it turns out that they, they tend to pr prefer barnacles over mussels. And, but they will reduce their foraging in response to the green crab, but they'll reduce it equivalently on the barnacles and mussels um, just in response to the green crab. So it, that doesn't change their preference hierarchy, the chemical cues in the crab. So that's basically, that's their, most of their food is composed of mussels and barnacles. Any other questions? Yes? So I observed a response after six weeks in the, the mussels. Um, and then after three months, it was a significant response. Um, in the whelks, uh, there's always a question of whether you run an experiment long enough to see an observed response, or if you run it too long. That's always a dilemma. Um, people have suggested that you can see this change in shell weight within about two weeks in the whelk. I'm not really sure if I believe that. Um, you, it, there's a lot of experimental error that can go into that. So I think six weeks is probably a, a good estimate for the, the morphological response. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of, each whelk, each muscle has its own personal tendencies. So there's a lot of, a lot of noise in those experiments. Yes? Yes. That's a good question. Um, I've only looked at individuals that were collected from the field. So within a generation, this would be the equivalent of a, a bodybuilder deciding that they want to be a prize fighter and sort of bulking up. And then they, they have that change within that generation. It's a, it's a phenotypic change that doesn't res result in a um, genetic change. In that. Right. I think in the next generation, they would start from scratch and sort of their, the, the clock or the, the, so the baseline gets reset. Unless there's some sort of maternal effect in which um, somehow the parent that has experienced this predation, experienced this bulking up effect or this induced defenses, then sort of somehow um, passes the infor information al al along to their offspring. And that would be a maternal effect. And those have not been observed. But um, with muscles, it's a little difficult to to raise the next generation. But that's, that's another experiment that I, plan, I hope to do with these whelks, is to expose two generations to these predatory crabs and see if there's a maternal effect that's passed on to the next generation. But that's sort of, that's contingent on NSF and it's contingent on the sequester and all that stuff. So it, who knows? Who knows if I'll get to that anytime soon. Yes? Mm-hmm. 
Yep. I attribute this mostly to stress. So I did look at their behavior in terms of whether they were open and feeding or not feeding at all. And they didn't, the, the muscles would respond to crush con specifics. So you, you mash up a muscle, throw it in the aquarium with other muscles, and the muscles in that aquarium freak out and they close up because they, they know something bad is happening. But you expose them to these different predator cues without a prey item. Um, and they don't know that they don't change their behavior in response to that predator. So that's just that's a kind of a gross, not gross, but a rough um, estimate of whether they're closed or open uh, as a response. But I didn't see them respond in that way, which isn't to say that over a longer period of time, they might be a cumulative effect of the multiple predators on their overall behavior. But within a, a few hours, there's no real change. Um, but these experiments, they were run for um, two and a half months. So this is a long-term exposure. And it's really hard to, so the, the behaviors and the morphologies are on very different scales in terms of the time it takes to observe the response. So it's hard to say if the behavior for these individuals didn't change. Um, I attribute it to, partly there's changes in growth in terms of the shell thickness, and they, they're trying to allocate to potentially towards both. But the increase in adductor muscle and an increase in shell thickness um, aren't compatible as a response. So there's, they can only serve one master in that sense. I've never been so totally satisfied with this, this reaction, though, and so any explanation I've come up with. Okay. Yes? the echidna? I believe so. Gotta get a new computer. Almost there. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah? Um, what the hell is that thing on the top right? I'm sorry. It, it on the top so right? Little, yeah, what is that? In Australia, they have these, this, um, it's, a, it's a fucoid algae called Dervilia. Um, fucoids on the east coast, north in the northern hemisphere, we think of fucus, we think of ascophyllum. These are small, diminutive, little, um, little fucoids. Um, in the southern hemisphere, these same or this this um, family is just the pervasive kelp. So these are these are um, this is Dervilia, and it's this enormous. Um, it takes the place of something like Macrocystis, which would be the giant kelp. Although they also have Macrocystis down there, but um, they're enormous. They have a, th a the thallus is that that the that big around, and the the blades are easily uh, one or two centimeters thick. Um, and they wash up on the beach, and they they're, they're a big contributor to the intertidal food chain there. Any other questions? Yeah, thank you for coming.